Good morning again, everyone. Thank you. So I've uh, prepared a, a few more illustrations than usual. That's why I'm getting this organized, first of all. So um, if, you, if you're like me, you enjoy a, a book with pictures, right? Uh, and I've got a few pictures to illustrate uh, uh, the talk today. And I hope this uh, comes up for you. Um, would it work to turn these off? Do anything? Uh, you can turn uh, that off. Uh, might not help, but uh, uh, OK. Do we have a? Yes, we do. Wonderful. Thank you. So I hope you can all uh, see that successfully. And um, when we think about humankind's experience, down through the ages, really since the first human beings, what's the most common sight that they've had? It's probably something like this, right? They've lived with that. No high-rise buildings for a long time. Uh, you know, occasional animal, if you're lucky. Uh, but this is a very typical scene, right? So there's sky and there's earth. So naturally, in the kind of journey of humankind, it became a very important metaphor for life. And the sky meant heaven, even when we say uh, Hanul Pumanim. Hanul is also sky in Korean, right? Sky parent. What a wonderful expression. <laughs> uh, so it's, a, it's, it's used as a, a kind of term to uh, be an analogy for heaven and the spiritual world and everything that's good. So the sky becomes everything that's good and the earth becomes everything that's dirty and, you know, because logically, right, you can't reach up and take a handful of sky, can you? So it's always a little bit out of reach, but it's very desirable and very beautiful and life-giving. Uh, but if you stick your hand in the earth, it comes out dirty, right? But yet it's also so necessary. These two are absolutely necessary. So, but they become used as kind of metaphors for good and evil and for this kind of pairing of uh, uh, opposites, especially after the fall of man. So it's been the case that you know, human beings have always tried to separate out certain ground as holy ground. The idea of holy grounds is very ancient, and it's in almost every culture. Uh, this one, can you guess where this comes from? This is Native American. People discovered these, you know, uh, some quite ancient ones, which are uh, medicine wheels, they're called. You go into this circle and you can experience some healing. You know, if you've got some trouble or some physical problem, you'll go. So you know where you have to go, William, right? Go to your medicine wheel, right? And, and there you would find some kind of benefit in this protected environment, kind of set off uh, spiritually. If you go to... Um, Tibet, you can see Mount Kailash. It's quite striking, isn't it? As a mountain. No wonder this becomes a holy mountain, revered as a holy mountain. And cultures have, as I said, always marked out certain spaces, even mountains, as sacred mountains. So you can see Mount Kailash, but you can't climb it. Nobody's allowed to climb it because it's a holy mountain. But you can make a pilgrimage there, and there's a 32-mile pilgrimage around the base. It takes one month for people to complete. Why? Because they're doing full bows along the way through the whole circuit of the mountain, and it's over a month. So this kind of devotion is nothing new, brothers and sisters, right? <laughs> and in fact, there are people who take it to much greater lengths or heights or, you know, seriousness than we might find ourselves doing. I speak for myself, you know. Um, so it's never been climbed so it can be kept holy. Very beautiful, Mount Kailash. Imagine turning the corner and seeing that. It would lift your heart, wouldn't it? Uh, others are constructed by human beings to be very peaceful places, different kind of aspects of piety and approaching the divine and the inner self. This is the Golden Temple in Kyoto in Japan, a very, very beautiful city, very beautiful place. 
amazing kind of stillness and these beautiful Japanese gardens. In the same uh, city, you can find Tofukuji uh, Temple in, in, in that city. Uh, this is also a very kind of harmonious, peaceful place to go. It's quite simple, isn't it? It's a garden, but it's really thought out, a lot of philosophy in put into this garden. It caused quite a lot of controversy, apparently, because this is very modern, and it's breaking all kinds of traditions. There are these square stones which start very ordered, and then they kind of fade and dis disappear into the randomness of nature. And it's all deliberately done, but caused a bit of, you know, un uncertainty among some people, if you should be doing this or not, right? If you go to uh, Vietnam, you will see um, just under 15,000 temples and pagodas in that small country, right? And many of them in quite hard to reach places like this. You think the extra devotion that's needed to build something, a holy place on top of a mountain, it's already, you know, you're making difficulties for yourself, but you're doing it for God, so it's not a difficulty. Right? Extraordinary. Here's another one. Maybe you recognize this, some of you. This is the Baha'i Lotus Temple, based on the kind of image of a lotus flower uh, outside of Delhi. And uh, very striking as architectural design, isn't it? And immediately draws your eye. You feel, I want to go there. I want to, you know, you see it reflected in the pool and, and go inside, I'm sure, out of searing heat into the coolness that's created in such a place. Uh, where do you have to go to see this beautiful temple? You have to go all the way to Neesden in North London. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the sky gives it away a little bit, right? <laughs> but, you know, it was crafted piece by piece and brought across and assembled by craftsmen to be a very beautiful, very treasured place um, right there in North London. Again, you turn a very ordinary street of semi-detached houses and bam, there you are. Suddenly this, all this sculpture and uh, I remember taking a party of uh, school kids there as, uh, in my teaching days. So every, I'm just picking just a few examples, but I mean you can find so many places which uh, people have set apart uh, for the special purpose of honoring God, of you know, um, leaving our fallen self behind and coming into an environment that we can say, this is holy. To be in that holy place, I have to bring my holy self, really. So for some traditions, that means, you know, uh, you have to put a hat on. And some places you have to take your hat off, right? <laughs> um, and some places the women have to put a scarf on. And some places the women need a hat. And, you know, I remember when we had the holy, the... Um, wonderful pilgrimages to the Middle East. Then uh, we were off to all these different uh, holy sites, uh, different religions, and uh, in the morning as we got on the bus, we'd be asking each other, is this a hat on or a hat off place? <laughs> right? uh, does it matter? I mean, it doesn't matter whether your hat is on or off. The, the point is I'm thinking, you know, when I'm going in there, I have to do something out of respect, you know, and if having the hat on is respectful, then I do that. If taking my hat off is respectful, I do that. Right? So the point is, is the heart always behind it. It's not the kind of, you know, the one is right or one is wrong. So, you know, this is the kind of thing we have to vault over completely and come back to the heart. Uh, everywhere I go, just mentioning these few points, I include a picture. Well, I've already got North London in there, so I'm not going to have another one. Uh, this is St. Patrick's Purgatory in Loch Derg, if you go to County Donegal in Ireland. This is a, a very holy site, maybe the holiest site in Ireland, and people will go there. St. Patrick is a saint for all Ireland, right? Catholic and Protestant, you know, it, he's the saint of Ireland. So there's a unifying factor right there. Very beautiful, very still. You can go on weekend retreats to Loch Derg. You have to pay quite a substantial amount. Uh, you begin by an overnight prayer walk around the lake and, and a one-day fast. 
I thought we should invent indemnitors or something like that and, <laughs> and, you know, give people this opportunity. Actually, people want this, you know. They don't want everything just uh, comfortable and, uh, you know, free. <laughs> <laughs> As some of us do. This is uh, Iona in the Inner Hebrides. Maybe humbler, but, but very holy and a place that people make long pil pilgrimage to go to and when they go there, they kind of encounter you know, God in a new and deeper way, and they continue to do that. And the more that you treat a place as holy, the more holy it becomes. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, so when you value something and it's maintained and treated with prayer, then it, it, it becomes that which you've invested in it, and therefore you feel you know, as you're approaching it, I, I'm coming into the presence of God. I'm in the presence of awesome God. You get that, don't you? Uh, are you a cathedral lover? I love going into European cathedrals. We're so blessed in Europe to have magnificent buildings that took hundreds of years to build. Well, people were happy. Well, not happy, but they lived in relative poverty, you know, and simple accommodation. But they built these magnificent structures to the glory of God. And you'll find often, even on the um, backs of the carved seats, the misericordia, as they call, where the you know, priests would sit or choir now sits, you'll, you'll see they're even sculpted behind, where nobody ever sees. Why? Because God sees. That's why. Forget about people, you know. God sees those things. So it's not just a plain back. It's something sculpted there. And therefore, you get little angels and uh, things way up. You know, you can't really make them out almost, but they're there for the glory of God. So uh, I want to just share one point which has always interested me about uh, sacred space. Because when scholars look at this, and I was doing some research on this at one time, um, you, you know, whether it's in the sociological area or the anthropology area, anthropology uh, apology of religion, or this kind of thing. Um, people are pretty much agreed that sacred space has certain attributes or qualities that make it sacred, that say this is this culture's sacred space. And they all work in a same way, so much so that these scholars uh, uh, look to like four points which express this. First, it works. This whether it's a temple or just a holy ground marked out in the earth, it's a center or a central point that people will come to. And, you know, that is where they have experience of the divine. It's also a meeting point, not only for people, but it's a meeting point between the spiritual and the physical realms. It's recognized as that. I'm leaving the purely kind of physical day-to-day -day world, and I'm coming into this interface between the heavenly world and the physical world. So it's physically very beautiful and a lot of investment, but also spiritually, it's very heavenly. And the music will be there. If you're in one of these lovely cathedrals, you might hear the organ or, you know, or the choir. And it's, it's an extraordinary experience, at least for me. So um, also they will say this sacred space acts as a microcosm. That means somewhere, it's like uh, they contain all things. They are a little encapsulation of the whole spiritual, physical world, and everything is in there. That's why if you go to certain uh, places, I'm thinking of the Mainu Chapel in Ireland, which is the main priest training place. Around it, so many sculptures, like of every kind of animal in the world, right? Why? Because this is God's creation, you know, it's all there. So you'll find monkeys and you'll find <laughs> all kinds of uh, creatures there and things that are expressing every aspect of God's creation. So I'm entering this place, which is a little model of the world, physical and spiritual. And finally, these uh, sacred spaces are a place of imminent transcendent presence, well, there's your academics talking, right? Uh, God is both with us, you know, he's right here and in us, uh, but he's also above us and beyond us, you know. So God cares about 
me and has love for me, and yet also God is the creator of the universe and is bigger than anything. So it's this extraordinary kind of hard to get your head around, you know, uh, almost paradox that you know, God is both very much present, imminent, you know, in my life, in me, but also is uh, bigger than the universe. So uh, this, is, this is God's nature. And you're in that kind of presence when you go to holy ground. Right. So remember those four points, right? Center, meeting point, microcosm, imminent transcendent presence. And this is the language which uh, scholars of religion are, are using generally about sacred spaces. Then we recall in Exodus uh, 25, 8, uh, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. There were lots of, there were debates going on in the Old Testament, right, about the, the value of a building. Can you contain God in a building? No. So why build a temple? But you build a temple and God's spirit is in there. So, you know, it's an interesting debate that seems to have good arguments on both sides. But the fact is, yes, God can't be contained in a building, but actually when I go to that building, which is set aside as something holy, I feel that holy presence and that's what I'm after, right? And that lets me know that God is real. So it's a kind of precursor of the Kevin Costner phrase, if you build it, he will come, right? If you build it, he will come. God will be there. So Israelites, of course, were asked and given detailed uh, explanation about how to build the tabernacle, which was the model that was then picked up for the more substantial temple. So this, this is a standard kind of uh, unificationist knowledge, right? And, but it's an interesting insight. I personally haven't seen it uh, anywhere else uh, that the tabernacle and the temple are a symbolic messiah, right? A symbolic messiah. So people are giving a, given a symbolic messiah, first of all, before the substantial messiah comes. Uh, because it's like a training if you can learn to respect and revere and attend the temple or the tabernacle and do that with a sincere heart and demonstrate that to God, when the Messiah comes, all of that devotion should be transferred naturally to the Messiah. Did all that devotion get transferred to Jesus? Unfortunately, no. Not in his lifetime. But it shows that it should have done. It, it already shows way back, uh, you know, centuries before Jesus, that this people were being prepared to attend and serve the Messiah as the most holy person, the only begotten Son of God coming, how much more we should uh, treat this person as holy than the holy temple. So this was the idea. Interesting idea, isn't it? Symbolic Messiah. Yeah, so get, get people kind of into the way of doing this and uh, doing it properly. So this is a model, actually, of the temple. Just um, uh, So it's, it's Herod's temple. This is the time about 15 to 25 years before Jesus. It went through renovations, I'm sure, as a kind of getting ready for the coming of Jesus because the temple was going to be very important in the Messiah's mission. The Messiah is a substantial temple. You could even say maybe Jesus should have been taken there in the early years of his life and brought up there. And he could be properly educated. He could become a teacher. He could have a suite of rooms there to receive foreign dignitaries and be the, you know, it's a ready-made building to do the job of the Messiah, isn't it? Again, we never hear of that happening because things didn't go the way that God originally intended but I think an interesting precursor to that is the uh, reading that we had from Samuel today, because this woman, Hannah, no relation, uh, she, she had no child for a long time. So she went to the priest Eli and said, pray for me, let's pray. She went to the temple and they prayed together. And she never forgot that prayer, because even though she'd been so long barren, God gave her a son. And 
when it came time uh, to take the uh, family for the annual kind of offerings and uh, expression of gratitude, she said, no, I'm not going to go. I'm going to wean this child. And when the child is fully weaned, I'm going to take him to the temple and offer him there. So if you think about that, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Here's somebody who's longed for a child and for a long time couldn't have a child. They pray for that child. The child comes. And then what's the response? Is I want to give this child back to God. Who does that child become? The child becomes Samuel. Samuel, who's the last of the judges and crowns Saul, the first king of Israel, you know? This is an amazing upbringing. So I sometimes wonder, maybe that was a possibility for, for Mary to think of Jesus. This is not in divine principle, but just in my own thoughts, right? So uh, just a kind of what if. You know, if you have that heart and God has revealed to you that this is such an important child and you are not really behind the, uh, you know, your will was not involved in the, in the uh, creation of that child, then thinking, how can he have the best opportunity, right? Well, um, Jesus himself, you know, when he did come to the temple, it was in a quite different circumstance. We'd just been through the kind of commemoration, this annual revisiting of the Easter week, the Passion Week of Jesus. So, you know, his final uh, entry into there, in one of the Gospels, it has him going in and driving out the money changers, upturning the tables, you know, because he sees that the temple is being defiled and not used for its original or proper purpose. And it hurts him because he is a substantial temple, right? And actually, this is happening to him, this kind of, his purpose is not being recognized, and he's not being valued for who he is in God's eyes. So uh, this is just a reflection of the people whose minds are somewhere else, and they're just interested in their own material gain. So he, he causes havoc, of course, it's putting him in greater risk and further danger. Interestingly, on the way there, when he raises Lazarus, it says in the Mark account, Mark 11, then Jesus began to teach them and declared, is it not written, my house, he's talking about the temple, will be called a house of prayer for all nations, for all nations, plural, right? But you've made it a den of robbers. So he saw this as a place, not just for Israel, but for all nations. No, leaders of nations should have come to the king of kings to, to offer their devotion and to put themselves at his service and to learn and be guided from him. Don't you think so? Yeah. So Jesus was there as the first kind of true person, the person who fill, fulfilled that first blessing that we talk about in the divine principle. Also, what does divine principle say about a true person? A true person, that means like Adam in perfection or Jesus, a true person, uh, it says, uh, this was in the first reading that we had, that section of divine principle, that person is a ruler of the universe. Okay? And that person is also a mediator between the spiritual and physical realms. They're in that particular position through their uh, spiritual growth and be able to assume that position that they can mediate between these two realms and actually uh, be a ruler then of the whole cosmos and themselves a microcosm, right? A substantial model of that whole cosmos. And then that person can become a center of harmony between the spiritual and the physical worlds, okay? So uh, that section of principle goes on to mention as well, like the air that enables two tuning forks to resonate with each other. Well, it just happens that I have a little prop here with me, right? These are getting hard to get because everything's digital nowadays. But you know what this is? This is a tuning fork, right? Now, if I had a wooden lectern, it would work very well. I may, thank you. 
and you're not going to hear that later. God made knees for this purpose. You can still hear it. Still going on, right? So it's a long, uh, long sound. It seems more sound you're getting out of it than you expect, right? Why is there so much sound coming out of this? Because these two prongs are vibrating together. So a true person acts as the mediator and the center of harmony between the two worlds. And the ability to communicate between the two worlds may be also likened to a radio or television which transforms invisible waves into perceptible images and sounds. Thus a person can accurately convey the realities of the spirit world to the physical world. So it's like saying that the it actually called it two tuning forks. I'm not sure if it means the kind of sympathetic resonance between two tuning forks. You know, you get some kind of resonance there as well. Um, but it, it works just between these two tines, as they're called. These. Why? Because one is in the image of the other, and the exact distance apart is related to the wavelength of the sound. So uh, when you strike one, the other vibrates in in sympathy, right? So human beings should be like this, right? creating a sound wave, right? Uh, so we're like the air in, no, a perfect person is like the air. So I feel that's a very useful little uh, analogy, really. God is always, no, perfect. God is perfect God. But imagine human beings a little bent out of shape. One of these prongs is bent. When you bang that on your knee and put it on some wood, is it going to make a sound? It's not going to make a sound, right? That sound only comes where there's one in the image of the other. That's when they resonate. That's when the energy comes and you start to hear the music, right? So this is why we need to straighten ourselves out, right? We need to become in the image of God and take on as godly a nature as we can, right? In our lifetime, so that when we are you know, on our road to completion then, and spiritual maturity, we're going to create the right vibrations here. So let's just put that together. If we think about the temple as sacred space, we had these points, remember those? Center, meeting point, microcosm, imminent transcendent presence. This is how scholars of religion are saying every sacred space, wherever you find it, has these qualities to it. Well, a true person has these qualities, is a ruler of the universe, a mediator, a substantial microcosm, and a center of harmony between two worlds. There's a strong correlation between these four points and what it is to be a person who's fulfilled the first blessing and is in the image of God. So that means, actually, in the unification principle, we can say, as we said, you know, tabernacle and temple, are a symbolic uh, or image messiah, but not only that, it means they have the same function. They work in the same way. That sacred space, and in Israel's day it was the temple, works in the same way as the messiah is going to work in terms of this function. So it's, it's more than just a, a symbol of the messiah to come. It's, it's functioning within the society, within the spiritual life of the faith community. It's working in the same way. Uh, only the Messiah, of course, is a quite different order uh, of experience because it's a living, breathing human being and able to share God's word and uh, uh, do so much more than a building can do. So um, at the time of uh, Jesus' crucifixion, um, you know, uh, the temple is mentioned several times uh, as accusation towards Jesus. Two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. How dare he say that, right? So that was considered blasphemy and one reason why Jesus should be put to death. And uh, you have St. Paul after the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus saying, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and the God's spirit lives in you? And at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, what is one of the things that 
that happened. Uh, in the temple, the curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place was rent in two. It was split. No, it's just a phenomenon that it ripped in two. And that was serious because, you know, nobody was meant to violate that most holy space. Only the high priest could go in that area and only once a year. So you might know that the people tied a rope around his ankle so that, God forbid, when he went into the most holy place, if he should die when he was in there, they didn't have to go in and collect him. They could just pull him out with the rope. That means I don't want to, you know, it's not for me to go in that place because it's so holy. In there, you are coming face to face with God, right? This is the feeling. So that's the kind of level of reverence or uh, fear of God in the right kind of use of that word that people had. So all that remains of that temple, of course, is the now called Wailing Wall, where uh, Jewish uh, faithful pray and slot in little prayers on paper in the cracks. And um, I went there on, on my visit there, and I, they tried to stop me, actually, from going to the wall because I wasn't Jewish. Uh, I didn't say yes or no, I just said, my name is Hannah. And they said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed to work, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, no, no untruth was told, right? <laughs> okay, uh, just, just bringing us up to date, right? Uh, here is uh, our holy site, our Cheongpyeong or Hyojong Chonwon area, uh, you know, this is becoming more and more lively. Each, you know, each time I visit, there's some new building or something new to see. It's an extraordinary pace of development in Korea generally and also in our movements, holy place there in Cheongpyeong. Um, now, of course, we're coming up to the dedication of the Chonwon Gung, this building in the foreground there. When I was last there, it was 2020, and um, we were there for a, a prior kind of dedication ceremony. And um, I was kind of thinking, you know, what is really the purpose of this? It's a natural question to ask. And at that stage, I hadn't heard so much about it, really. Um, but I thought, well, you're in Chongpyeong, so there's no better place the, to pray than, than this place. So I prayed, and God gave me a vision where I saw the whole area, that whole valley, was full of people in bright Korean clothes, a mass of people. And when I looked carefully in this vision, I saw that these were distinctly women in shorter than South Korean chimichogaris, which are North Korean style dresses. Right? So it was full of North Korean people. And this is, this is North Korea. This is Pyongyang, right? So it's the kind of... Uh, Chongpyeong equivalent, I suppose. Um, and then uh, I saw all these people there, and what it told me is, actually, this building is not for me. Right? It's for the future. Sometime that barrier between North and South Korea is going to go down, right? And a mass of people who are very pure-hearted people in North Korea, they're easily taken in by the whole ideology and the whole story of Kim Il-sung and his grandson, and you know, they're, they're, that's all they're told, and faithfully they just believe that. But they're very pure-hearted. It's why they're so susceptible in many ways. Uh, so those pure-hearted North Koreans, uh, imagine that, you know, we're not around, even true parents are not around. Uh, then how are they going to learn about true parents? Can you ask them to look in a book? Or can you ask them to, you know, go to a workshop and hear a lecture? No, I think the time for that will be over, right? They need something, some experience. So True Mother is creating an experience through this Chon Wong Gung, which includes kind of museums and fun things to do and sculpture parks and arboretums and, you know, have a great holiday there and learn all about true parents and their life and their extraordinary legacy at the same time. So you'll get that in a day, you know, 
and you'll absorb all that. And then you'll come out thinking, wow, I know who true parents are, who my true parents are. And that's a very, very kind of direct experience. Like I say, in a way that I don't need that, I think, but, and so it's, it's quite hard. It's easy to criticize, but it's, it's quite hard to feel uh, that. But put yourself in the mind of somebody else, you know, in the future. How is this legacy going to be passed on? I think that's what uh, True Mother is wanting to do with the Chun Wong Gung, which is here. This is still in the uh, design picture stage here. Um, but, you know, this is what it's going to look like inside. Interestingly, there are fonts there, large fonts with holy water. <laughs> Sounds a little bit uh, Catholic to me. And uh, also in Islam, of course, you, you ritually wash yourself before entering the, the mosque. So it's picking up on certain traditions and you're going there into the inner sanctum. It's not the holy of holies in the sense of the uh, Jewish temple because everybody who has you know, enough kind of uh, qualification, you say, and it's not a very nice word, but they can go in there, right? If you've made certain preparation and conditions, you could go into that most holy place and you'd, you know, uh, the assurance given, you know, already, you know, if you build it, he will come, is that when you go in there, you will have this profound experience. I have no reason to doubt that. I think people will go there and have very profound experience. And, uh, you know, God will be there as he is everywhere. So finally, just some nice words to end with. Right here uh, in the Pyonghua Gyeong, Father says, if you live a life of sincere prayer and devotion, for three to five years, you can liberate your mind from the body's horizontal and habitual influence. For me, personally, that's quite a judgment, right? <laughs> right? What have I been doing all these years? Uh, but that's, you know, that's possible. That means if we are really serious, that's possible. So that brings to mind the sins of omission, right? And Father often calls uh, religion a repair shop, right? I love that expression, right? When you go to the repair shop, you cannot stay there forever. You need to come out reborn. While the religious life is a required course for all humankind, it's not the basic purpose or whole purpose of life. We have to graduate from that eventually. From now on, people will gradually come to perceive God and to understand the spirit world and the works of spirit people. People will become conscious of their internal person. Their spirit self and their spirituality will develop. This will happen. Right? People will go through these kind of changes and development. People who change their character to fit the way of heaven are the true people of God's hope. So I mention that because the purpose of uh, much of our religious life, but also this uh, 40 days in which we're in, is to do just that, is to change something. Indemnity conditions are there to change my heart. You know, that's the purpose. My heart needs to change. And it's a way to do that, because we know it's, it's actually quite difficult to change yourself, right? But this is a way that God gives us through his grace to, to change ourselves. And when we uh, really uh, apply ourselves with sincerity, then result comes, for sure, you know? It's never that no result comes from that. Even if we offer it to God for his purpose, to use, to do something good with and to something valuable, Someone, somewhere will change, and the world will change. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please join me in prayer. Our loving heavenly parent, we want to thank you for the uh, opportunity that you give us, especially in this time of uh, special grace, which we've been granted again, not for the first time, but you are calling your sons and daughters to... Uh, clean up ourselves. Uh, I felt this morning that actually these grace ceremonies 
the, I don't know if it's right to say, but I felt you are standing back from these because this is not your job, this is our job uh, to do this. And um, you, you've given us everything we need to do it. Therefore, it's just down to me what I make of it. That's, that's all. And then I offer it. And then my hope is that at the end of that time, you accept that offering and you receive it. So your job is just to receive that. Uh, we thank you for being there for us. We thank you for giving us these opportunities to repair ourselves that little bit more and to make progress in this spiritual life. We pray that we can, as a result, benefit each other and benefit the community and even benefit the nation. So we thank you and we offer this prayer of gratitude to you in our names, uh, David and Kyung Jahan of the Blessed Central Family. Adieu.